Hi everyone and welcome to another edition of Calabasas A Living History. I'm your host Pablo Pereira. We're a show about the movers and shakers here in Calabasas and people who have made a difference. No one probably more so than our own county supervisor Zev Yaroslavsky. Heck, he's been in politics for some 40 years but recently announced he's soon going to hang it up. So we sat down with Zev recently to talk all things politics, all things Calabasas, and quite a few things, uh, well, that Zev wouldn't normally talk about, but he can now that he's retiring from office. So let's go inside and talk to Zev. All right, so we're here with County Supervisor Zeb Yaroslavsky. Thanks so much for being with us this afternoon. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to start things off with a kind of a blast from the past. I like okay. to do that because we're kind of celebrating your your career here today, and that's what we'd like to do. So I was I was doing a little research, and I found uh, an old picture yeah, of yeah. you. Yeah, very very old. Uh, <laughs> well, well, wait a minute. When you look at that picture, what kinds of uh, memories, things does that bring back for you? Well, that was my first campaign for the city council in Los Angeles in 1975, and uh, it was kind of an ins insurgent campaign. I was uh, not expected to win. Uh, I didn't expect to win, but uh, I followed a game plan and ran against uh, several candidates who were uh, better funded than I was and had far better uh, endorsements of prominent politicians uh, than I did, but uh, I walked uh, almost every door in the flatlands of my district during that campaign. My wife did too, and and uh, put up those lawn signs that are in that picture. And mm -hmm. uh, and over a six-month campaign, we managed to uh, to win a, 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 an election going away. So it was. It was a, very memorable. The first, the first championship is always the best, as John Wooden used to say. As it said, and you were what, 26 years was, old then? I was 26 years old, and uh, it, it was, I think at the time I was sworn in, the third youngest city councilman in the history of the, of the city of L.A. And uh, Roz Wyman was 22, and uh, Kenny Hahn was uh, 26, but a younger 26 than I was. And uh, there have been one or two others uh, since that have been in, in, in the mid-20s uh, range. So I was a young, young man, but my district, uh, which was at that time the west side of Los Angeles, what I call Beverly Hills adjacent, I was the donut, Beverly Hills was the whole. Uh, that district tended to elect independent people, young people, people who pushed the envelope. And uh, it's a great constituency, uh, not unlike the one I represent now, but just on a, on a smaller scale. Uh, they give you a lot of license to do innovative things and to, uh, to challenge uh, the government, to challenge authority, to challenge the status quo and, uh, and re-elect you anyway. And uh, I really feel lucky to have represented a constituency uh, like that. And uh, they elected me uh, six or seven times in, uh, in that city council race and then in that city council district and then in the uh, County Board of Supervisors uh, five times, so it's been uh, it's been a good ride. Well, we look at this picture here, and we'll put it up full screen. We, we don't want anyone to miss it, right. you know. <laughs> and now we look at you know a picture more, and well, that's maybe not current. It's getting more current. Right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you think you look any different than you did back then? Uh, I I have a, a better barber than I did back then. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> and I have a little more gray hair than I uh, than I did back then, but uh, I haven't. Uh, you know, I have my mother's genes. I haven't aged uh, in the same way that a lot of people do when they uh, when they get it, get to my age. So I feel Is very blessed. Is that just men? Do we just think we look the same as we did twenty? Well, 30, I don't know. You be ago. the judge. Uh, I think you look pretty yeah, good, actually. Yeah, I, uh, my wife thinks so too. <laughs> uh, I, I have no opinion. Uh -huh. I'm in that do not know category in that kind of a poll. What the picture doesn't say is the experience over 40 years. What have you learned over 40 years, simply put, about politics from then <laughs> to now? Well, what, what, what do we all learn in, in our, you know, from, from the, our young adulthood to, uh, to our late adulthood? Uh, we learn a lot. Uh, you, you learn from your experience. We're all, all a product of our experience and our environment. Uh, you know, it was Mark Twain who said uh, when he was 14, he was appalled at how little his father knew. Uh, but by the time he was 20, he was amazed at how much he had learned in six short years. Uh, I've learned a lot in, uh, in in 40 short years, and it has felt short. Uh, uh, yeah, I learned a lot about people, uh, about uh, 
uh, respecting people, uh, walking a mile in somebody else's shoes, especially in, if you're in an elected position or if you're in any kind of a service-oriented job. Uh, your, your challenge is to put yourself in the shoes of the person you're there to serve so that you can best serve them. I've learned a lot doing that. Uh, I've, I've tried to put myself in the shoes of, uh, of people who are homeless, people who are uh, facing mental illness uh, problems, uh, uh, people who are poor, uh, people who are hungry, uh, as well as uh, the, the majority of my constituency, which are uh, middle class, upper middle class, some quite affluent, uh, uh, and, and have issues that are of concern to them. But uh, putting yourselves in the shoe, putting myself in the shoes of, of the people I serve has been uh, really the most rewarding thing because you learn in a visceral sense, you learn what the challenges are and you, then you act on them because if you're, if you're in their shoes, then you know how pressing the issues are that they're bringing to your attention. I remember a, a night uh, during a rainstorm, one of these long rainstorms that we had, and the power had gone out in my neighborhood. Uh, I, was, I was on the city council at the time. And uh, the DWP had power outages all over the place. And one of the places was in my track where I live in the Fairfax area. And uh, the, the power outage had gone on for 72 hours. And uh, a delegation of people from one of the streets that had lost their power came to my door at about 10 o'clock at night and knocked on the door and said, you know, Councilman, what are you going to do about this damn problem? Uh -huh. And for a split second, I, I felt put upon, you know, like how incon inconsiderate of them to come to my front door at 10 o'clock at night, and I caught myself and I said, wait a minute, if I had been in their shoes, I wouldn't have waited 72 hours to go to the councilman's right, door. Right. I would have been there the first night. And, uh, and so what does that mean? That means that you, you get off your couch at 10 o'clock at night, you call the Department of Water and Power, you get an answer, you know, how long is this going to be? How long is the, is the outage going to be? Because people want to know, this is one of my axioms and one of the things I've learned is if, if you tell people bad news and you tell them how long the bad news is going to last, they can adjust to it. What drives people crazy is when there's a problem and it goes on forever and, and you don't know when it's going to end. So if I tell you for the next 72 hours you're going to have no power, uh, you can take your meat out of the freezer and put it in your sister's freezer and you can make adjustments, whatever you need to do. But if I tell you there's going to be a power outage, but you don't know how long it's going to be, and it goes a day and two days and three days, now you're wondering, is it going to go a week? You know, tell me when, it, when the, uh, I'm going to be out of my misery and I'll adjust. And we've done that, uh, and this has been one of my cardinal rules with, with public works projects. When we close a road, Carmageddon was one such thing on the San Diego freeway. Imagine closing the, one of the busiest freeways in the world right. for, for you know, 50 hours or whatever it was. Uh, and, but we, we said to people, we're going to close it at 10 o'clock Friday night. It's going to be open by 6 a.m. on Monday morning. You know, adjust your lives accordingly. We had no complaints about it to speak of. But if we had just shut it down without warning yeah. people and without telling them how long it's going to last, mm -hmm. my phones would, would have been ringing off the hook. So these are the, you know, putting yourself in the, in the, in the shoes of, of, the, of the constituent, of the citizen, is I think the most important quality an elected official can have, or a salesman can have, or a minister or a rabbi can have. You've got to be able to feel uh, and, and empathize with, with the people you serve. Uh, it's not just an intellectual exercise. It's not a statistical exercise. Well, you say that, and you say that from 40 years of experience, from the young 26-year-old councilman to, to you know where you're at now. Yeah. But do you think in this day and age of politics, maybe we've gotten away from that somewhat? That some of the newer politicians aren't practicing what you've really come up with as a fairly simple formula? Well, I think some of the politicians do. And uh, the ones that are successful and, and have lasted a while and, and have made a mark in their, in their level of government, uh, uh, they do that. Uh, those who don't do that don't last forever. And, uh, of course, now you don't last forever anyway because of term limits. And that's been one of the things that's changed the nature of politics and politicians is you have, uh, you, have you know, if I'm an assemblyman until the law recently changed, I had six years to serve as an assemblyman. And so my half-life was three years. I'm not thinking about anything beyond six years. Uh, I'm not thinking about building a new highway or, or, or a new you know, infrastructure that's not going to have its ribbon cut 
till the seventh or eighth year, I'm looking at what can I do in my term of office. And in fact, most of the people in Sacramento have have looked at, you know, how can I uh, advance my career? Where am I going to advance my career? Almost as soon as they get sworn into the first office, they're already looking at the next office. So there's a different attitude. When I came into office in 1975, there were no term limits. So even though I didn't anticipate being an elected official for this long, uh, every election uh, was on the horizon. And if I wanted to get reelected, I had to do my job well. And uh, I, I, I wasn't termed out. Uh, there were unlimited terms. So if I wanted to be viable at the next election, I'd have to do my job extremely well, which means listening to people, responding to people, sometimes disagreeing with people, but explaining why, and, uh, and just build that level of goodwill and a reservoir of, of integrity in your thinking process that people would respect. So I have people today come up to me after all these years and say, you know, I, you and I crossed swords on a project or an issue in 1982. Uh, but I respected the fact that you would hear me out, that you gave me a reason for why you disagreed with me, and, and I voted for you ever since. I mean, that's quite a compliment to an elected official, that you, you, you do something that, uh, that a citizen, a voter, disagreed with you on, uh, but they vote for you anyway. That's, uh, you know, I, I represent a very challenging district politically. This, these are not uh, shrinking violets who I represent. Right. Many of, you know, Golda Meir used to say when, she was asked once, how many, uh, how does it feel to be the prime minister of three million Israelis? And she said, I'm not the prime minister of three million Israelis, I'm the prime minister of three million prime ministers. Well, I'm the supervisor for two million supervisors. I mean, there's not a soul right. in my district who probably couldn't do as good, if not a better job than I can, or they certainly think they could. And so I, it makes me, be, it makes me uh, do a better job, it makes me be on my toes. Uh, so do often. you think if term limits weren't a factor now in your office that you'd, you'd still be there? Or, or well, were, you, were you starting to wind it up in your head thinking, you know, maybe it's time to do something else? Well, term limits went into effect for the Board of Supervisors in 2002. So I've had, I've had a long time to think about it, 11 uh -huh. years now. So I've seen it coming. Uh, and. Uh, and I, I'm not a believer in term limits. Yeah, I figured uh, I, that. Yeah. I just think uh, it, it has totally destroyed our system of government, especially in the state legislature. Uh, less so at the local level because the terms are a little longer. Uh, but, uh, but I'm glad in my case that it happened because it takes the decision out of my hands. Mm -hmm. And it, it, uh, it forced me to, uh, it forced maybe the wrong word or convey the wrong impression, but uh, it required me to look at what I was going to do with the rest of my life. And and I think 40 years or 39 and a half, which is what it will be when I retire at the end of the next year, uh, is long enough for anybody to be an elected official. There are very few people who have served that long in this country at any level of government. And there probably will be none who will serve that long, thanks to term limits, uh, in this state uh, in, in the foreseeable future. So uh, I think 40 years is enough and uh, there are other things I do want to do and I can't tell you for sure if we hadn't had term limits that I might say you know I'm going to give it one more term because there's still things I want to get done and there are things I'd like to get done but I'm just not going to be able to do it and I'm perfectly sanguine with the notion that my successor is going to have some things that he or she is going to want to do and uh, they're going to have the opportunity to do it. I'm leaving them something to do. Well, <laughs> There's it, plenty to do. You, you sound a little bit like an athlete. I mean, it doesn't sound like you're ready to get out of it all together. And there was, of course, a lot of talk about you uh, running for mayor. You chose right. not to do that. That's right. Why? Because I think 40 years is enough. And uh, I've always said to myself that when you, when you, you know, get out uh, at the top of your game, if you're, if you're getting a little cynical about things and a, a little tired of certain things, uh, that's a time to, to move on. Uh, so are uh, you getting cynical oh, I've, tired I've of become, things? I've become tired of things, uh, uh, not really, but uh, cynical about things a little uh -huh. bit. And, and it's hard not to be cynical in any walk of life, not just government or politics, after you've been doing something for this long. Now, I tell you th that, but that's, that's not the overwhelming emotion that I, I understand. That I feel. Uh, I mean, I am very... I love what I do. I wouldn't have done this for this long if, if I didn't love what I do. It's, it's not easy. It's hard. It's challenging. 
I love challenges. Uh, you know, I've had an opportunity to change the face of Los Angeles in a lot of ways, culturally, environmentally, uh, fiscally. Uh, I, I'm very proud of, of, of my record. There are some things you know, I wish had gone other ways, but uh, for the most part, I, I'm very proud of, of my achievements. But, uh, but I think uh, you know, the notion that I'm the only one who can do this, uh, that there isn't another person among the two million voters and residents of the mm -hmm. third supervisorial district who can be a county supervisor uh, would be would really be arrogant on, on, on anybody's part, and I don't feel that way. And there will be good people uh, out there who will run for my seat, I hope, and, uh, uh, and will have an opportunity to put their fingerprints on the, the next 12 years of let's, L.A. County. Let's talk a little bit about the 3rd District, and yep. we're going to obviously narrow it back down to our area in Calabasas, sure. but it, it's, it's got all kinds of different things going on. I mean, Calabasas is certainly different than than Marina del Rey or Brentwood or something like that, isn't it? I mean, you, you, you kind of provide certain services for everybody, but just because of the geographic nature, there's a lot of differences there. Well, it's a great district. Uh, the, the county is divided into five geographical districts, each of which are equal in population, one to the other. Uh, that's, uh, that's prescribed by our county charter and by the state constitution. Uh, we are governed by five supervisors. There's no elected executive for the county of Los Angeles or for any of the other counties in California except for San Francisco, which uh, is a unique situation. So we're governed, our 10 million people in LA County are governed by this board of five people. And Mono County, where cows outnumber people 30,000 to one, mm -hmm. uh, they're governed by a, a similar five member board. Uh, it's a crazy form of government, but that's the way it is. So I represent uh, the, the district that is the western part of Los Angeles County. And Calabasas is at the western end of the western part of Los Angeles County, just a few miles down the road from the county line with Ventura. Uh, the district is very diverse. Uh, many people don't realize that. Uh, yes, we have a lot of, I have Beverly Hills and uh, Bel Air and, and Hidden Hills and Calabasas. And, and uh, I also have Pacoima. And, and the city of San Fernando and uh, Arlita and, and uh, Sun Valley and areas where we have high level of uh, uninsured people, people who don't have uh, health insurance, uh, a high level of poverty uh, or near poverty. And uh, I remember the day I, I had a whole full schedule of events on one, one Saturday or Sunday. And uh, in the morning I was at, uh, at a meeting, a community meeting in Pacoima where the issues are gang violence and poverty and, and hunger. Uh, and then from there I went to uh, Westlake Village for the uh, opening of the yachting season. Did you clothes for these things? Or did I you? didn't, uh, uh, I, but I took off my, uh, <laughs> I put on my tie, I, uh, I guess, when I, when I left uh, Pacoima. But, but that's the kind of reach that you have from, you know, from one end of the economic spectrum to the other, from one end of the socio socioeconomic spectrum to, to the other. And there's never a dull moment. And the, the issues that a county supervisor deals with on a daily basis is every issue that's important to the, to the region and to the state and to the country. Uh, health care, mental health, child welfare, uh, arts and culture, uh, the environment, uh, development, you know, preservation of the Santa Monica Mountains, which is the most precious resource, one of the most precious resources we have environmentally in our county, uh, to uh, transportation. I, I'm a, all five supervisors serve on the... MTA board of directors, uh, and, and I've certainly uh, done my share there. Uh, and so there, there's a whole panoply of issues that if you don't want to deal with transportation one day, so you deal with mental health or health or child welfare or child deaths in our uh, foster care system or what have you. Uh, and if you're tired of that, you deal with transportation, you deal with the arts. Uh, it, it's, it, it's, a, uh, it, it's, it's an invigorating job. It's one of the most interesting uh, and powerful, frankly, if you're a policy wonk, it's a uh, powerful position, uh, one of the most powerful local government jobs in the country, far more powerful than the mayor of Los Angeles. Uh, you, you don't get as much fame, but in terms of the levers of government and being able to do things, actually get things done, uh, the mayor of New York, the mayor of Chicago, and an L.A. County supervisor are probably uh, three of the top local government jobs, which is why over the, over the decades you've never seen uh, a county supervisor uh, leave the, the board for higher office, because it really is 
There's really only I one higher that. office that you'd want, or two, you know, U.S. Senator or Governor, and a couple of them have tried for the U.S. Senate over the last 50 years, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, are not unhappy that, they're, that, that they ended up where they are. And so uh, it, it's, a, it's, a great, it, it's a great place. If you, if, you're, if you love policy like I do, uh, even more than politics, then there is no better job in the state of California than, than a county supervisor in Los Angeles. This office, not at this particular physical location, but it was close in proximity when you got here in, right. in Calabasas. And you probably, like myself, uh, I mean, I remember as a young kid coming out of here, my dad worked as the architect on the Motion Picture Hospital, and I remember coming out here, and there was nothing out here. And I'm even going back before right. the 90s. How has this area changed in your time in the super, supervisor's office? Well, it hasn't changed much since I've been a supervisor because we've done everything in my power uh, to uh, to protect this area of the county, the Santa Monica Mountains part of the county, uh, from the kind of uh, unbridled development that created Calabasas and Agoura Hills and Westlake Village. Uh, you know, it, I, I have a very strong bias towards uh, uh, protecting our natural resources and our, and our environmental resources. And the Santa Monica Mountains is one of the most significant environmental resources in the entire state of California uh, in terms of the vegetation, in terms of the wildlife, uh, you know, the riparian streams. Uh, you got the Malibu Canyon is one of the deepest canyons in California other than what you find in the high Sierras. Uh, these are, are very special areas and if uh, the county had been left to its own devices you would have had Calabasas type subdivisions all over the place. And in fact, the first year that I was a county supervisor, I fought a battle to try to stop uh, a Calabasas type subdivision over on the other side of the hill towards Malibu in the unincorporated mm. area and uh, was unable to do that. But that was the last one I lost. And uh, uh, so what we've done is preserve the rest of the mountains. Calabasas is here. It was developed in the 1980s. It was approved by a, a different supervisor. It was part of a different district at the time. Mm -hmm and uh, as was Agoura Hills, but uh, I don't want to see the Santa Monica Mountains become like uh, Santa Clarita Valley and, uh, you know, Valencia, it, it just mile after mile after mile of subdivision, uh, destroying some of the most precious habitat that we have. There's no reason to do that. Uh, we have to learn to live compatibly with our environment, mm -hmm. and that's been my philosophy in, as a county supervisor, is we let the develop the terrain develop. I'm sorry, we let the terrain dictate the development, not the development dictate what the terrain's going to look like. You've seen the city of Calabasas. Obviously, you have one of your two district offices here. Yep. What do you think of the job they do as for for a small city government? I mean, obviously, you, you, you're in touch and in tune with the city officials here. Well, I you know I don't. I don't handicap uh, my cities. I represent 10 cities. Uh, they have a tough enough job without me uh, uh, giving uh, a critique uh, of, uh, of what they do. Uh, uh, Calabasas is a big city out here. Uh, it's, it's the biggest of the, uh, of the Conejo Valley cities, and, uh, and it's got a diversity of, of, of an economic base that none of the others have. Hidden Hills has no commercial or retail. Agoura Hills has very little and Westlake Village has very little, and, uh, and Calabasas is quite, you know, has, has quite a bit uh, for a city its size. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated city because you've got a, a lot of people with different points of view about some very important issues. Development remains a, a major issue out here uh, for the people who live in Calabasas. Development in Calabasas is an issue, and develop around Calabasas is an issue, as it is for Agoura Hills and Westlake Village. And, uh, and you have different points of view represented on the city council, and so the politics is spirited. And uh, uh, I, I commend anybody who gets involved in local government, especially at a small city level. Uh, I think the toughest job in, in politics or in government is to be a, a city councilman in a small town, because you can't hide and you can't run. You've, you've, uh, we're sitting here looking at several brochures on emergency survival, fire yeah. safety, uh, evacuation plans. That's that's really at the forefront for you and people who live in this part of your district, isn't yes. it? Yes. Yeah. This is uh, uh, this is a very very dangerous area during certain events. Uh, in a Santa Ana wind condition, 
It is, uh, we drop everything in our office and we all focus on, on this area because most of the fires that, that have hit the Santa Monica Mountains have started in the Calabasas area or north of Calabasas or even as far north as, as uh, the north end of the San Fernando Valley where Topanga, one of the last fires we had here started at Topanga Canyon up near, you know, near the foothills of, of the Santa Susana Pass and it moves very fast. The fire moves very fast. So fire is a, an important issue for us. Flood, uh, floods and, and rainstorms. Uh, when we had the 100 year rain a few years ago, uh, we actually came out of it reasonably well in the Santa Monica Mountains, but, uh, but we did have a few major slides, one of, one of which over in the Malibu side, which cost us $12 million to repair. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, we said we have four seasons in, in, in this part of the county, uh, fire, flood, uh, and uh, what's the other one? We say in Los Angeles, uh, fire, flood, uh, riots, and earthquakes. Right. So, uh, so when's the rest uh, period? So, there? so we we we've been very uh, fortunate here uh -huh. over the last uh, decade. Uh, we've had one major fire, and uh, just uh, keep knocking on wood that we will uh, not have any major fire again. And the fire we had. Uh, the one that started up in Topanga, North Topanga, is uh, turned out not to have a, uh, not to have a lot of property damage. We were very lucky, and uh, part of that is because the, the citizenry around here has taken seriously what the county fire department and our office have, have preached incessantly for uh, for many years, which is you know do the things that inoculate your property uh, from fire, clear the brush around your home and around your structures invariably when there's a major brush fire that comes across the Santa Monica Mountains, the buildings that get burned down are the ones that didn't clear their brush and the ones that survive almost always are properties that did not have, uh, that, that uh, had cleared their brush around their structures. And it, it's like brushing your teeth. You don't want to have cavities and you brush your teeth twice a day and you floss and you use your water pick. And then the result comes every six months when you go see the dentist. For us the results come when we do what what we're asked to do, the results come during the autumn and we're about to come on that season. The Santa Ana wind conditions are uh, soon to be upon us. The super scoopers have arrived from Canada early this year, August 15th they arrived and so they'll be available to us as, as will the other aircraft that we lease during the course of the fire season. So it's a big deal for us and, uh, and we, we have an incredible uh, matrix of uh, uh, of volunteers in, in the Santa Monica Mountains, the, the Topanga Community Emergency Preparedness Program, the people who stand watch during Santa Ana conditions to see where, if there are any fires uh, erupting. The, there's a, an animal rescue uh, group that rescues horses uh, during a fire. I mean, one of the biggest problems we've had over the years is when there's a fire out here in the horse keeping area, uh, the owners of the horses come running home from work to sa save their horses, which is natural. We created, with the community, a community created with our help, uh, a, uh, a horse rescue operation so that if you're working downtown in a skyscraper and there's a fire in Calabasas, don't run back to Calabasas to, uh, uh, to get in the way of the firefighters who are trying to put out the fire. Mm -hmm. We will have been there already with our uh, horse rescue and it's worked, it's worked beautifully <clears throat> and it's now expanding all over the county and some of the other rural areas of the county. And, and I think people need to be clear and some pe most people are but I still think some people might not be as to the responsibilities of a city like Calabasas uh, you know they have a local government there are things you go to them right. for but a majority of the things fire safety police protection uh, come from you, from, come from the county. Well, it can, and it does in the case of Calabasas, Agoura Hills, and Westlake Village, and Hidden Hills. Uh, uh, a city, when it incorporates, has a decision to make. Do we provide our own police protection, create our own police department, or do we contract with the county of Los Angeles or somebody else uh, uh, for that service? Well, the county offers a very generous rate to contract with us for fire and, and police services. The sheriff provides the police services under contract to these cities out here and uh, the county fire department provides the fire protection. Uh, very generous, in fact some of us think too generous but, uh, but so be it. <clears throat> and, uh, and it works very well. Uh, the, the half of the sheriff's department in LA County and half of the fire department are contract personnel, people who are contracted out to various cities and the other half service the unincorporated areas uh, which we have plenty out here. In fact, this is the only part of my district that has any unincorporated areas. 
And uh, we have the best fire department, I think, in the country. Uh, the the, the uh, diversity of, of uh, disasters they have to deal with, uh, from, from rescuing people in floods uh, to fighting wildland fires to fighting your conventional municipal structure fire, they're, they're great. And uh, we're very blessed to have them uh, here. And the county sheriff's department has done an outstanding job uh, in, in for the county and especially for the Conejo Valley. So yeah, the city of Calabasas has done the economically smart thing uh, and the policy smart thing to, you know, they don't need to create their own police department. They're not big enough to have their own PD, but they, uh, they contract with somebody who, who can deliver them, you know, a, uh, an off the shelf product, which is quite good. And the crime rate out here is very low compared to the rest of the county. I, in, without asking you the obvious question about your biggest success and failure, I get the feeling that the Santa Monica Mountains is really maybe not your biggest success, but maybe something you're most proud of. And I guess my question to you would be, why has it been so important to you? Well, uh, the Santa Monica Mountains are very important to me. Uh, and uh, first of all, I love, I love the open spaces. I, I, I love nature. Uh, my dad, uh, would take me to the national parks when I was a young kid, and uh, I, I guess those ranger talks had an impact on me. And uh, uh, I was, I had the privilege of serving with several people in government. Uh, Marvin Browdy, who was a colleague of mine in the LA City Council, who was one of the fathers of the Santa Monica Mountains movement, uh, he educated me a lot about what could be done. Uh, educated me really about uh, no, no challenge is insurmountable uh, unless you walk away from it. And uh, but to put it differently, as someone once said, uh, Wayne, Gretz Wayne Gretzky didn't make 100% of the goals he didn't, uh, he, he didn't try. Uh, and uh, so I, I learned from him, Tony Bielenson, who's been one of my mentors uh, over the years, another father of the Santa Monica Mountain. So I, I had that education as I was growing up in this field. And then when I became a county supervisor, uh, the Santa Monica Mountains became front and center. This is, this is my only unincorporated area. This is where I have some influence, a considerable influence and, and power uh, to determine, along with my colleagues on the Board of Supervisors, how do you zone these properties, you know, what properties to buy. I authored uh, in 1996 a uh, Proposition A, which was a park, uh, county park assessment district, which raised uh, almost $200 million to mm -hmm. buy open space and, and uh, create parks. Calabasas has a, a park that was funded in large measure by that proposition. And many of the properties that we have purchased here in the Santa Monica Mountains came from that measure. And uh, yeah, I care a lot about it because it, it's a legacy issue. You, 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 God isn't making mountains anymore. So you, you saw off a ridge line, you're sawing it off forever. Uh, nobody ever put a ridge line back. And, uh, and, and so I'm in a position where I can make a, make a difference. And that's why most of us who went into public service when when I did, inspired by uh, JFK, who, who said we you know we all long to make a difference. Well, when it comes to the Santa Monica Mountains, uh, I've been able to make a difference not by myself, but along with a, a lot of like-minded uh, people like uh, Sheila Kuehl and Fran Pavley and Terry Friedman and uh, Tony Bielenson, uh, people who uh, uh, who have toiled in these vineyards for a long time. And so, yeah, I care about it. It's not the only success I've had, and, it's, uh, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't even declare it a success. I think we've made a lot of progress. Mm -hmm. But uh, we will not be successful in the Santa Monica Mountains until every valuable, environmentally resourceful piece of property in this area is protected one way or the other, either through public acquisition uh, or in some other fashion. And we continue to work towards that goal. So let's flip that around a little bit. When we started this interview, we did, and you wouldn't characterize it as a success maybe, or one of, or your most important, but on the on the other end of the thing, when we sat down for this interview, you said, let's get going, I gotta get back to the office, I wanna beat traffic. And that's a word that uh, nobody likes to hear. Uh, Measure J was something that you supported, didn't pass. I mean, we're still in one of the areas here, at least regionally, I know we have the blue line coming in on the west side and stuff, but this particular area could use better public transportation, couldn't it? Well, sure, every, every area of Los Angeles could use better transportation, but uh, let me be perfectly blunt. When you decide to live out in the middle of nowhere, 
uh, this isn't the middle of nowhere, uh, but you can see it from there, from here. Mm -hmm. okay? it's, uh, uh, the, you pay a price for it. You pay a price for this clean air and, and for the, the, the wonderful afternoon and evening breezes uh, and the dry, the dry summer uh, heat. Uh, one of the prices you pay is that it's harder to get from out here uh, to civilization mm -hmm. <laughs> down there. Right, right. right. And, uh, you know, I, and I think everybody understands that. So there's not going to be a subway out here. There's not going to be a light rail line out here. Uh, it, it's not economically feasible and justifiable. Uh, when you look for funds for, uh, for a transit line in, in this country, and, and most of them are funded in, in large measure by the federal government and some significant measure locally, uh, you're competing with other, other communities around the country uh, where they measure the average cost per passenger mile. Well, the average cost per pas passenger mile, if you had a rail line to Calabasas or Agoura Hills, would be astronomical. While the average cost per passenger mile, if you go on a subway from Western Avenue to La Cienega along Wilshire Boulevard, would be far less mm -hmm. uh, intimidating. So those are the, some of the things. But there are other things we can do in places like this. Uh, trains are not the only way to serve people. Um, uh, buses, uh, express buses, high occupancy, uh, I'm sorry, uh, bus only lanes like we've done on the Orange Line. and. We talked to the city of Calabasas a while back. It's still a good idea, and, and uh, you know, we ought to pursue it uh, when, when the funding becomes available to somehow get a connection between Calabasas and the Conejo Valley and the Orange Line, because the Orange Line is now not just from North Hollywood uh, to Warner Center. It now goes from Warner Center to Chatsworth. So we've created a, the, the beginnings of a system in the valley alone through the high-speed uh, high busway. Uh, which uh, is breaking all records, over 30,000 boardings a day. Well, I mean, and, you know, you can take some credit for that because I was on the trip to Brazil. You were there. With you. You were there. You were there. And we went to this, little, well, it wasn't a little town, but a Curitiba. Town. Two and a half million people. And yeah. we sat and we studied this. I came back. I filmed it. You did your thing. It, it got funding pretty quick, and I would dare to say that it may be one of the most successful public transportation systems ever built if you look at ridership. Yeah, the, in terms of ridership, uh, I mean, the whole thing was, uh, was, was a natural. And when we were down in Curitiba in the late 90s, uh, we saw right away how this could work along railroad rights of way that we have acquired, but uh, there are no trains running through them or on them anymore. And, uh, and we were lucky. That was the last time the state had a surplus around the late 90s, right around 2000. Uh, then Assemblyman Bob Hertzberg was able to get uh, a couple hundred million dollars from the state surplus to help pay for the Orange Line. The Orange Line ended up costing $350 million uh, for 13 miles. That's a bargain. It, it's, it's better than a bargain. Mm -hmm. it, it's absolutely <laughs> uh, unbelievable. And uh, to build a light rail line for the same distance would cost you three, four times that amount of money. And, uh, or let's put it this way, the Exposition Light Rail Line that goes from Culver City to Santa Monica, which is seven or eight miles, uh, is going to cost us a billion and a half dollars. Why, then why do one one way and one the other way? I, well, I, I'm I, not clear. I, I believe that, uh, well, part, I believe that we ought to be doing a little bit of both. Uh, mm -hmm. Trains can carry more people because you can have more cars. The most, the most number of cars we can have on a busway are two bus cars bus cabs hooked together. In Curitiba, they actually have three. and We could eventually get to that. Uh, but, uh, you know, on Exposition, on uh, uh, the subway on Wilshire Boulevard, I mean, Exposition is going to carry over 75,000 boardings a day, uh, if not more, by the time it opens to Santa Monica in just a little over two years. Uh, the Orange Line, if it was a rail line, uh, probably would carry a lot more. And, and the Metro MTA needs to look eventually at converting the orange line into a light rail line. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't do it because, A, we didn't have the money at the time, so w I had to make the executive decision along with mm -hmm. a lot of other people. Uh, do we wait, you know, till the money comes, which could be five years or could mm -hmm. be 25 years, or we have the money to build a busway, let's do that now and we'll worry about a train later. So we did the we did the latter, and it's worked out just fine. So when was the last time you rode the Orange Line? Uh, it's been a few years, but uh -huh. uh, but I've ridden it a lot. Uh, in, in the first five years, I rode it all the time. That was my baby. I mean, I, I 
I was uh, uh, vilified for it uh, along the route. People didn't want it. The people who lived there, they thought it was, you know, the worst thing since uh, you know, since the Black Plague. It was just terrible. Uh, mm -hmm. People uh, were hanging me in effigy, literally, and my friends, and uh, <laughs> and, and we. Uh, but we listened to them, and this goes back to what I said earlier. You listen carefully to what people have to say. If people have good ideas that, that are critical of where you're coming from, it pays to listen to them because people sometimes do have good ideas. In fact, oftentimes they do, and some of my best ideas I stole from citizens who wrote me and said, mm -hmm. why don't you do this? Have you ever thought of that? And so we listened carefully. Uh, the Orthodox Jewish community in North Hollywood along Chandler Boulevard were concerned about how their parishioners would be able to access the synagogue on the Sabbath because mm -hmm. they have to walk. How are they going to get across the Orange Line? So we created a a uh, crosswalk in the middle of the orange line. And, uh, and the, the rabbi, is a great story, the rabbi said yes, but they'll have to activate the, uh, uh, the walk don't walk sign and they, they aren't permitted under their religion to, to activate <laughs> electricity. Uh, and uh -huh. I said, not a problem. Our Mormon traffic engineer back in 1975 invented something called the sabbatical light for the Orthodox neighborhoods in the Fairfax area. Where when we were getting, just installing walk don't walk signs for the first time. And uh, it, it, he said, we have a computer, we can computerize it so that on Friday nights through Saturday night, it automatically goes to a walk phase. So I told the rabbi, we'll do that here. So we took every issue off the table, and, when, and he was my biggest critic on this. And then uh, he retired, the orange line opened, he came back, there was a reception, and uh, I saw him at the reception and I said, uh, not to bring up a sore subject, Rabbi <laughs> Sugarman, but have you seen the orange line? He says, yeah. He says, how do you like it? He says, what's not to like? And I said, that was the best endorsement uh, of, of our efforts. And we, we took a lot of heat on that, but it was, it was worth it. And now, if I propose to, to deconstruct the, the orange line for some reason, I'd have people lying on, <laughs> in, front of the, in front of the tractors mm -hmm. because the, the valley loves the orange line, and they should. This is their baby. And, uh, and, and the, the, one of the great things about the Orange Line was that 20% of the people who rode the Orange Line in that first year were people who had never ridden public transportation before. And that was music to my ears because it's not enough to get transit dependent people from slow buses into faster buses. It's important to, for us to get people like you and me who always use our cars to occasionally uh, use public transportation. And by the way, I do use public transportation from my home to, to downtown, uh, one bus, and, and I'll do it uh, every couple of weeks if I don't have to come out to Calabasas or mm -hmm. don't have some circuitous route I have to take. And because the bus system is really good in LA and, uh, and it's very inexpensive. It's uh, the cheapest bus system of any major metropolitan bus, uh, bus company in the entire United States. Yeah, but let's take a break. We're going to come back. We're going to learn a little bit more about some of your likes and dislikes and your plans for the future. Is that all right? Yeah. Okay. Very good. From coast to coast, cops are cracking down on seatbelt violations. Buckle up day and night or expect a ticket. It doesn't matter who you are or where you live they'll be on the lookout. Cops write tickets to save lives. Click it for ticket. All right, we're back with uh, Supervisor Zeb Yaroslavsky. Did anyone ever mess up your name? My name gets messed up all the time. Have you had that same problem? <laughs> is, the, is the Pope Argentinian? <laughs> right. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, I've had... Uh, What's the worst, uh, the worst uh, thing they've ever done to your I, name? I don't know if it was the worst, but it was the most famous because Chick Hearn once introduced me at a Laker rally after they had won the uh, NBA championship one year and he was introducing all the politicians on the platform and he just butchered my name so badly that it became a news story in the next morning's paper. Uh, it's, uh, you know, when I first ran for the city council I had a button, I couldn't put Yaroslavsky on the button, uh -huh. too, many, too many letters, so I just put Zev. And so nice. I'm happy when people call me Zev. You know, there 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 are a handful uh -huh. of people who are known in this town by their first name only, and and I'm one of them. And it's uh, it it served me well. Good. Uh, now we can get to the kind of some fun stuff, some questions. You know, you're not running again, so yeah, I don't I think I, you don't have to be politically <laughs> correct anymore. Right. And uh, you know, you just mentioned Chick Hearn, who we all love. But I'm going to ask you to name your favorite sports team in L.A. 
You can yeah. only pick one. UCLA Bruins. Uh -huh. That's college, right? Obviously, that's a that's, that's a, a, sports a natural choice. And what do you think of Jim Mora? I think he's doing a great job. Uh, you know, nothing succeeds like success. So uh, I like him. I like what he's done to the football program, and I'm looking forward to the coming season. And maybe just maybe a national championship, and you wouldn't have to be at all these SC national championships. Would you enjoy that one day? Well, I, I represent a lot of SC. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm uh, talking. This is but, you know. This is after. But I will. I will say. Uh, I'm, I'm a very loyal and uh, avid Bruin fan. I'm UCLA is my alma mater, uh, and I, I think a national championship in football is not beyond the realm of possibility. He's if he stays long enough. Uh, Jim Mora can build a very good program. People love him, and uh, they have confidence in him, and that's that's what a coach is all about. If if the players have confidence that he's taking them on the right track, then they'll, mm -hmm. they'll follow him anywhere. UCLA basketball, been a fan my whole life. I mean, the expectations 20, 30 years ago, I remember at Poly Pavilion, if the team didn't win by 50 points, everybody thought there was something wrong. <laughs> And people would leave feeling we only yeah. won by 45 points. There's something wrong with the team. You've got another new coach there. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel about the basketball program? Well, we'll see. I think uh, I think the basketball program has has some challenges, and uh, with the new coach, uh, you know, he's got his hands full. So uh, I'm looking forward to uh, to seeing how how he performs. I thought they did a great job last year. Uh, I, I was a uh, uh, yeah, I'm an avid UCLA basketball fan. I, I, I go to many of their games, and and I've been doing that since I was a college student there. Uh, I thought I thought Howland was the coach of the year in in, in the Pac-12 last year. He had a a, a challenging group of kids, uh, some with injuries and some who had quit on him, and uh, ended up winning the uh, the conference championship. So the new guy is going to have uh, his hands full because. Uh, uh, this is a this is a very competitive conference, and and uh, and the expectations for a UCLA basketball team are always unrealistically high. I mean, ever since John Wooden retired, I don't think Absolutely. any any coach who succeeded him has uh, has ever had the crown rest comfortably on his head. It's just, uh, and John Wooden retired the same year I first got elected, 1975. Oh <laughs> uh -huh. It's been almost 40 years since he mm. retired from basketball, wow. and yet the uh, the legend of Wooden. Uh, like like at Notre Dame, the legend of Newt Rockney hangs over uh, over the uh, the head of the of the new coach. Can a politician take something from a coach like Wooden? Oh, I you know I I've taken a lot from Wooden. I, I feel privileged that I've gotten I had gotten to know him uh, in in the last 25 years or so of his life and uh, spent quality time with him. I read every book he's written, and yes, sir, they, they you, there are. A thousand things you can learn from from him, and and he's put it in in some uh, very important books. Uh, one that he wrote with Andy Hill, one of his former players, uh, it was a short book, but it, it it has the salient elements of his philosophy of leadership. And I bought that book for every member of my staff, and I said, you know, read this. It won't take mm -hmm. you but a couple hours, but you'll learn everything you need to know. I've I've addressed the county managers association, all the general managers, department heads. And their their deputies, and, uh, and and quoted from Wooden's books because it's it's not about sports; it's about leadership. It's about you, you know your your own your own self and how you carry yourself and how you motivate people to do whether it's make baskets or whether it's to fill potholes or whether it's to police a city. Uh, every walk of life. In fact, that book when you went to the bookstore was not in the sports section; it was in the business section. Gotcha. And, uh, and I, I really uh, learned a lot from him, and I, I feel privileged. Favorite professional local sports team? <laughs> right now it's the L.A. Dodgers. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> I went to the game last night, uh, and silly me, I left after seven innings. They did. were down four to two, <laughs> and I was able to get home in time to watch the, uh, the comeback on, on my home television. Uh, I love this team. Uh, who doesn't? I mean, it's... Uh, it's a fascinating phenomenon. I'm told by people in the media industry that the ratings, the television ratings for the Dodger games has gone through the roof. Uh, I was at the Hollywood Bowl Tuesday night uh, for a uh, performance of Verdi's Requiem uh, conducted by Gustavo Dudamel and in every box around me, in every seat around me, 
uh, there, uh, there were people on their iPhones keeping tabs on the Dodger game, myself included. I mean, this has become a mania in this town, and uh, it, it, it's exciting. I think that people don't realize growing up here that, I mean, and, and I love the Dodgers. My grandma was a Brooklyn Dodger fan. I love the Lakers. And we've seen the Laker championships. We've gotten spoiled by them. We've seen the celebrations. And I just have a feeling that if the Dodgers were to win a World Series, we'd see a celebration ten times the size of a Lakers celebration simply because Dodger games are so accessible to, to everybody goes and gets well, to experience. Well, it, it is the national pastime, and uh, and we haven't had a, na a national or a world championship, World Series championship for, in, for the Dodgers since 1988. That's uh, it's a whole generation and a half. So, yeah, I think you're right. I think it would be a hell of a celebration. And I think the, the city is, in the, the county and the region is in love with this particular team. I mean, they just do not quit, uh, even, even if some of their fans they quit <laughs> after seven innings. <laughs> yeah, you learned that lesson. All right, favorite movie of all time? Oh, my God. Uh, I'd have to say Godfather 2 would be one of them. Uh, I'm not a big uh, movie buff when it comes to... Uh, uh, dramatic movies. I'm, I'm a big documentary uh, movie yeah. lover, and I, I I love watching them. And the good documentaries are so informative and educational. Uh, but uh, Godfather Two is a great movie. Favorite actor. Favorite actor. Uh, I I don't know uh, if I have a favorite actor. Uh, I love Jim Garner because uh, I loved his acting, but I also loved him as a as an environmentalist and and as a constituent who worked with with me and. In getting the oil drilling prohibited along the coast of Los Angeles when I was on the city council, uh, so I'm I'm biased toward toward him, and uh, there there are so many I couldn't pick one. Favorite musician. Favorite musician. Well, there's several. Uh, I, I I love the cello. Uh, I used to play the oboe as a, in junior high school, but uh. the cello is my favorite instrument to to listen to, and. Uh, uh, Yo-Yo Ma, Jacqueline Dupre, uh, who of course died uh, prematurely because of a muscular uh, disease, tragically, uh, was one of the great cellists of all time. Uh, I, I love Yitzhak Perlman. Uh, I love Gil Shaham. The, uh, these are two violinists, of course, and and, uh, uh, and pianists. Uh, you know, there are a whole bunch of them. Uh, that uh, I wouldn't want to single anyone out, mm -hmm. but I am a classical music lover, and uh, yeah. I, I, I just uh, I, I was raised in a household where music, classical music, was important. My mother made me uh, study the piano when I was five or six, and uh, then in junior high school I, I learned to play the oboe. I had a great uncle who was a, a bass player, bass violin player, who played for the Sol Hirok orchestras, who traveled across the country with the European ballet. So I got to sit in the orchestra pit with him and turn the pages when I was a little boy and got to hang out with Nureyev and Fontaine backstage at the Shrine Auditorium. I, I've been intensely exposed to uh, classical music and classical ballet, uh, which as I say to all of my teachers that, that I speak to, I said, you know, just because a guy in your class doesn't know a whole lot about music or, or tries to blow an A and it comes out like a B flat, doesn't mean that one day he won't end up being a member of the County Board of That's Supervisors true. on the day you have to decide <laughs> whether to pull right. the plug on Disney Concert Hall or not. And so I ended up, you know, through fate being uh, one of the key people to make sure that the Disney Hall project stayed alive and, uh, you know, Dick Reardon, Eli Broad, Andrea Vandekamp raised the money to, uh, uh, to, to build it, and, uh, and we have it now. And, and one of the reasons, and I don't say this out of any pride uh, or self-pride, but I, I say it because I was deposited in this seat at that time, and if it hadn't have been for a few people who influenced my life in classical music, it wouldn't have been important to me. All right, so you've name-dropped a couple of venues. What's your favorite place to go see a concert, then? Well, uh, to see a concert and hear a concert, Disney Hall may be one of the three or four or five greatest halls in the country, uh, in, the, in the world, not the country. Uh, I think it is the greatest hall in the country now, and it's still young, and the, uh, the hall as it ages will become like wine and even finer products. So Disney Hall, 
I don't think most Angelinos understand or appreciate it, is, uh, is one of the great concert halls in the world. And people, all the great artists in the world are coming here because they want to play there. Conductors are coming here because they want to conduct there. So that's my favorite, single favorite place to hear a concert. To experience the concert environment, the Hollywood Bowl, I knew you were going to say is, that. Uh, yeah. you know, which is a county facility, and, uh, and, and we've invested, uh, the public has invested a lot of money to upgrade it and to transform it from a early to, mid uh, early to mid 20th century amphitheater to what is now a 21st century uh, theater. Uh, it's, it's, the, uh, it's the only place in the United States where the Philharmonic Orchestra of that city plays both in the city during the winter and in the city during the summer. This is the summer home of, the, of one of the great orchestras of the world, and, and to sit out there on an evening under the stars uh, is as pleasant and pleasurable as it was you know, 80 years ago. When first concert you saw there? Uh, I don't remember the first console, the concert I saw there. Uh, honestly, I, I remember being taken by my mother and father mm -hmm. uh, uh, to see a concert. And I don't. I don't know that I had. Uh, it wasn't Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass? No, that was mine there. No, no. I, I haven't <laughs> seen many of the pop concerts there. I'm, I'm a classical music guy, gotcha. and uh, uh, and my parents used to go there a lot. My parents came here to, to L.A. in the late 30s, mm -hmm. and uh, my dad used to. My mother died when I was uh, relatively young, and my dad used to tell me the stories about my mother going to see Sergei Rachmaninoff. Uh, conduct and play the piano at the Hollywood Bowl during uh, the, during the war years. And, uh, and, and she'd wait for him outside the, the stage door, wait for him to come mm -hmm. out and shake his hand. Well, I told that story to the uh, Philharmonic leadership a few years back, and uh, on my 60th birthday, they gave me a very special gift, a copy of the program from the 1943 concert where Sergei Rachmaninoff mm -hmm. conducted and played uh, his own uh, second concerto, the piano concerto. Uh, so. That's it, it's uh, I love the bowl, uh, and you know, if I could just say a word about the arts and culture in Los Angeles, we are so blessed and so lucky. If we think about what's been built in this town in the last 15 years, Disney Hall, the, the County Museum of Art has expanded two pavilions. The Natural History Museum has just rebuilt the most, the oldest institutional building in our city. Uh, the, uh, the the Performing Arts Center at Cal State Northridge the Broad Stage at Santa Monica College, the Getty Center, the Getty Villas. Mm -hmm. uh, I could go on. All of this has been done in 15 years. And if we had just done the Disney Hall project or just renovated the Hollywood Bowl in the last 15 years, we would have called it a good decade mm -hmm. and a half. But we are the lucky ones who get to partake of all this largesse. Running out of time, I want to ask you what the future holds for you after 2014. What are you going to do? I don't know yet. And uh, I've actually tried tried not to think about that too much because the minute I succumbed to that temptation of trying to plan my life post-2014, then 2014 is going to be in my rearview mirror, and I can't afford to do that. I've got a lot of, a lot of things I want to do between now and December 1st of 2014. Uh, but I'm not going to leave town. Uh, I'm not going to uh, tend the, the fruit trees in the backyard. I'm going to be active, and, uh, but not as an elected official. Uh, I make may do some academic stuff. I may do some uh, writing. I definitely am going to do some writing. I want to write a book uh, about my life and times, not so much about me, but my times. And, uh, and I got a lot of stories to tell. And I'm a big believer that people like myself, like Roz Wyman, like Vin Scully, uh, ought to write a book. Uh, Wyman and Scully refused yes. to write a book. Uh, if, if, if only for my kids, I'd like to do that. Thank you My so pleasure. much for your time. Okay. You tell great stories and we're glad you Thank you very much. My pleasure. Well, that's going to do it for this edition of Calabasas, A Living History. We hope you've enjoyed the program. Now, we don't know what the future holds for Zev Yaroslavsky, but whatever it is, we certainly wish him well. For more information on this program, or if you have a program idea, you can always log on to our website, cityofcalabasas.com. I'm Pablo Pereira. Thanks for joining us.